agriculture. It's the economic engine that drives this region. On this episode of Valley's Gold, we're picking apples and kiwis. From tree to vine to dine, we'll learn about these delicious treats. So join me, Ryan Jacobson, as we grab our baskets and head into the field. Valley's Gold is produced through a partnership between the Fresno County Farm Bureau and Valley PBS. Production funding for Valley's Gold is provided by the Myers Water Bank and Wildlife Project, an educational outreach program working to teach students about water and wildlife issues in California. Field trips are free for all schools and each trip's curriculum is based on learning about California water resources Valley Agriculture, and Native Wildlife. Everyone enjoys getting together to laugh, to talk, and mostly to eat. It sounds so simple, but the reality is that it takes a lot of hard work to feed us. The next time you sit down to eat, remember to thank our farmers, Gar Tutelian Incorporated since 1949 at 800-696-6108. Heroes come in all shapes and sizes. At Brandt, our heroes are the men and women in the field, the folks who work hard to put food on our tables. Join us in celebrating the Valley's real heroes. Brandt, professional agriculture. I've traveled down to Early Mark to meet up with Zach Stoller, farm manager with Sun Pacific. Zach, thanks for joining me. Hey Ryan, good to have you, thanks. Tell me about Sun Pacific. Sun Pacific's a very large, diversified uh, agricultural company here in the San Joaquin Valley. Grow uh, anything from citrus, cherries, walnuts, pistachios, kiwis, tomatoes. Um, we, we do a little bit of everything. Well, that's awesome. Well, to begin with, I think there's some simple terminologies. It's a kiwi vine, correct? That's correct. It's uh, it's more similar to a uh, a, gr a grape vine than a than an actual tree. Mm -hmm. And Irrigation. I mean, I look around. It's a very similar irrigation system to a vineyard as well. Uh, yeah, we uh, predominantly uh, Sun Pacific. We use a fan jet system as opposed to drip, but um, that's that's mainly because of uh, humidity and the amount of water that we need to apply um, uh, throughout the growing season. We can we can accomplish that with a fan jet a little more efficiently than and drip. Humidity in a kiwi vineyard is actually a good thing. That's that's correct. As opposed to a, a, a great vineyard, um, kiwis ki kiwis thrive on humidity. Culturally speaking, what's it take to grow a California kiwi? A lot of labor. <laughs> yeah. Um, January to February, start pruning. Um, they generally bloom or start start coming out of uh, dormancy. March, bloom, April, May, and then uh, they'll they'll produce a, a flower or a bud, and uh, we we either flower thin or or and then and then once uh, we bring the bees in, pollinate the fruit. We fruit thin. B big flowers, small flowers. Very large, very large. Okay. Flower. Um, and Zach, you mentioned these take the pollinating services of bees. Are there pollinator plants? Yeah, so um, we, we range anywhere from 10 to 15 percent uh, males or pollinating uh, plants. They, they don't produce any fruit, but they produce the, the pollen that, uh, that uh, takes fertilizes and fertilizes. makes the fruit. Yep, that's correct. Okay, and so we're, at this point we're starting to enter the late spring point. What does it take to keep these things healthy during the summertime? Um, kiwis, ki kiwis generally take uh, anywhere from 40 to 48 inches of water, um, and uh, you know, generally they're they're not a, there's there's not a a lot of pests 
pest control that we have to do. It's just, it's just water and fertilizer throughout the year. And then as you enter close to the harvest season, when is the harvest season? And how do you know it's ready in time to go? So harvest, um, it, it's all dependent on the year, but, but generally it's, it's late October through, through November. We, we check uh, various things to determine that they're ready for harvest. Um, we, have, uh, we, ch we check the firmness, we check dry matter, we check bricks um, to, to determine how, how well the fruit will store because um, as, you, as you may know, we, when we pick this fruit, it doesn't get, generally it doesn't get picked or packed right away. We put it in storage and, and pack to order or pack later on. So we wanna make sure that the fruit's firm enough, has enough sugar, has enough dry matter that will, that, or the dry matter is, is the right amount that it will, it will, uh, it will store properly and, and not go bad. And then when it comes to that harvest season, what does it take to harvest a kiwi? Um, a lot of people. Yeah. Um, yeah, we, when, when, generally when the, when it's the, all hand labor, it's, it's all, all hand labor, being, it's all hand picked. It's all yeah. hand picked into bins. The bins are loaded onto trucks. Trucks are taken to the storage facility and it, it's, it's a massive amount of, you know, we range from, you know, t 20 to 30 crews a day wow. har har harvesting, de depending on where we are in the valley. But it's, it's a, it's a big, uh, logistical effort to, to are, get are in the bin. Twisted off, or are they being cut off? Uh, no, it's a, it's a hand motion. It's hand motion, yep. okay, got it. So, and then it will go to the end of the row, it'll be loaded onto a truck, and then taken to the packing house. Mm -hmm. What happens at the packing house? For, for a while, nothing. Yeah. <laughs> um, we, 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 we put them into, uh, we, we, what we, we like to say is we cure them, we, we uh, put them into cold storage or, or controlled atmosphere, yeah. and, um, and store them for as long as feasible, meaning uh, depending on the market or depending on the the quality of the fruit. Gen generally, um, we, we pull it out of the bin. It runs across just a conventional packing line. Um, you know, a sizer, yeah. optical sizer. Gets. Uh, we we do a ver various types, but we're doing a lot of clamshells. Okay. Um, and um, we we equate it all back to a 20-pound box and goes to market. Where does this product end up? I'm assuming all over the place because California. When you talk. California kiwi, it's one of the only places obviously we grow it in the United States, correct? Correct. And correct. so it will go everywhere, both domestically and some probably foreign shipments as well. Mm -hmm. uh, we, we, uh, we ship a, a, lot of, a lot of fruit domestically. We, we uh, seem to do pretty good, but we are uh, you know, opening up to, to, to export as well. And when the consumer buys this from the store and takes it home, what's the right way to finish off the ripening process? So we try, we, we try our best to assure that the, the product is ripe when uh, when the consumer gets it in the grocery store, but Mother Nature's you know yeah. sometimes doesn't you know sometimes a little cruel, and uh, and the consumer might have to wait a little bit. Um, it, it might be a little little firm when they get it home. So the easiest way is just to uh, just put it on the the counter or put it in a paper bag with a banana and and just just keep an eye on it. And when it's when it's soft enough, um, it's ready to go. Is there a right way to eat a kiwi? Most people most people just just cut it and. Scoop it out, scoop it out yep. put it on a salad, put it in the cereal, put it whatever they're going to do. Um, I'm, a, I'm a skin on kind of guy. Yeah. You know, if it's ready, just, just take a bite out of it. Got it. Okay. Well, great. Zach, you've been incredibly informative. Thank you so much. To let me know a little bit more about this incredibly important industry that a lot of folks just don't play know about. I appreciate it. Thanks, Thanks so much. <laughs>
Uh, we have jobs throughout the year, though. Yeah. This is not just a one-season job. We uh, we have to prune in the, in the winter time, um, then we thin during the summertime. And, and one thing about you, you mentioned pruning during the winter time. You actually are in minor snow uh, company here. You get a little bit of snow, somewhat in some years. Uh, there's been years I've seen six feet here. Oh wow. Okay. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so uh, needless to say, those those times we're not here doing anything. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So then, when do you expect to see some of the first blossoms popping? off of these trees? Uh, March, April okay. is when we see those. And we, we have our, our uh, pollinator trees, the crab apples. They come off first. We bring bees in. We get them down from the high school. And, uh, and they go around and they cross pollinate everything. Take care of all from, these. Yeah, from those uh, pollinators, the crab apples. And we have those like peppered throughout the orchard. Yeah. So it makes it easy for the bees to find. Yeah, exactly, exactly. And, uh, and then Tim, the reason I have you here, it's harvest time. And harvest time is obviously very labor intensive, but you have a unique partnership here with Metal Lakes. Talk about that. I do. Um for 50 years, I've known the owners here, the Wyricks, and um, they approached us this spring and asked if our uh, little church in Auberry would like to participate in uh, the labor here and in turn uh, make some profit and uh, it'll go towards the ministries of our church. Wow, that's yeah. awesome. And you must enjoy it. You're out here, you get to be a little bit out in nature as well as uh, oh, yeah. the view isn't too bad either. The view's <laughs> awesome, man. You gotta love it. I mean, yeah. just to see the fruit of your labor. Well, talk about yeah. that apple picking process I mean too complicated is there any secret to taking that fruit off in the right way well I think timing is the most important part we actually check the uh, sugar level oh, okay. of the certain varieties uh, it's a thing called a refractometer and you check the bricks level it's called and we're looking for like a 16 is the ideal number so we check and check and when it's ready to pick then we come out and we'll begin with a select pick <laughs> so you're looking for apples that come off easy you don't want to have to rip them off the tree exactly and then you'll come back and then you need a little more labor and you go ahead and you just pick all the apples of that certain variety. Yeah. And then off to the packing shed and we sort and we wash and we clean and then right into the cold storage and then you get them to market and start selling them off. One fun thing here is you guys have lots of different kinds of apples and I'm sure you could probably name most of them off the top of your head, but I have a few of the ones that I just saw walking around here that I thought were really neat. First off, tell me about this guy. Well, this is an Arkansas black apple. Uh, it comes off late in the season. That's the good thing about our, our crop here is we have apples that come off early in the August, in the fall, and then they go on until the end of the fall. Wow. So that way we have a big season and we don't just you know pick one yep. variety and then they're done. So these come off late. And when you say black, it looks like a plum. I mean, it, it is it looks as close like to plum. black as, yeah. It's, uh, they will put on a waxy, really waxy coat when they're ready to be picked. Yeah, um, this is just on the front end. You said this isn't quite ready, probably in two or three weeks late, two, October, early weeks. November, yeah. Yep. yep. This yeah, one beautiful. is uh, very distinctive. I got to taste this one without even really knowing what was made up, what it made up of. What is this? This is called a winter banana. A winter banana, but we're talking apples here today. We're talking apples. <laughs> Looks like an apple, tastes like a banana. It has a banana flavor. I would not have believed you, but without you even saying anything, opening it up and tasting it, it tastes like a banana. Right. Unbelievable. Right. So I really enjoyed it. I mean, like I said, you talk about a novelty item, that's incredible, but the texture and the flavor is just great. They are pretty awesome. And what's this guy? This is obviously a gorgeous red. Yeah, this is a, a Rome apple. We used to have a big variety of these, and then we grew grafted them over onto your winter bananas Got actually it. so there's there's some trees out there that actually have two different <laughs> apple varieties on one tree, on one tree. yeah that's, pretty cool that's great well great well i've learned a lot about apples never ever remotely thought about this being a crop here just above the valley floor but uh like you said you guys are doing an incredible job here making some gorgeous fruits so yeah robin we appreciate you tim thank you so much for thank letting you. me learn more about the california apple nice <laughs> Have come by apples. <laughs>
Stephen came over to California following his older brother who came over during the gold rush didn't pan out for him, so to speak. <laughs> and he decided, well, geez, I know how to farm apples. Watsonville in the Power Valley, great place to grow apples. I'm gonna go and start growing apples in Watsonville. And one thing when I look at the brand, there happens to be, it's Martinelli's, very recognizable, but there's also a gold medal that's attached to it. Is there a little bit of a history associated with that? There's a lot of history with the gold medal. The gold medal for us, uh, you, in the uh, late 1800s, early 1900s, they, there were a California state fairs where they were grading apple juices, apple ciders from across uh, the California, I think outside of California as well. We won every gold medal that uh, was, it was offered, and, and they haven't done that recently, but that was really established the quality of our product. Absolutely. Now, when it comes to terminologies, I got to begin with the basic. What is a cider? Is there an actual definition of what a cider is? So a cider is a juice and a juice is a cider. You know, there's, there's more, it's a regional sort of language. From the East Coast in the UK, the terminology is a cider. There's a very common okay. apple cider. Uh, the way ciders and juices are termed now, they're one and the same. Everything produced here is non-alcoholic? 100% of what we do is non-alcoholic. Got it. So let's start walking through this process. I mean, is it a complicated process to take those apples from the time they receive to the end product? What goes on? Apples are harvested predominantly in this area from September through November. Our production cycle starts in September but lasts through April. So the first step in the process is making sure we have high quality cold storages to make sure we maintain the quality of that apple while we hold on to it through the course of our production season. And the next step is to bring it into our production process. And the first aspect of our production process is cleaning that apple. So we have brushes and a water system that gets all the debris and any, any dirt that might come in from the field, everything off of that apple. We have about 12 people who are managing a line and visually inspecting every single apple to take out the apples that may have rot in them or at least making sure that everything goes into our process is 100% fresh quality juice. The next step is to grind that apple into a mash so that in our pressing system we can maximize our yield. Got it. But because we're from fresh apples and we're from concentrate, we sacrifice a bit of yield so we can maintain the taste quality. So the way we press apples is somewhat unique. We have a system where all of that mash goes into uh, cloth bags, a, a, a specific woven fabric bag and then pressed like an accordion. Oh wow. Where the pressing system presses, releases, presses and releases the free-flowing juice comes out uh, from that process. Then we have a settling tank. To very, from that point on, it's very similar to wine in terms of how we settle out the juice, make sure that we separately filter the bottoms, which have some of the residual uh, pulp in, uh, in the juice from the apple, and then the tops, which are clearer. We separate, separately filter them in different processes to make sure we really get that pure color, that golden color that we have. We recombine the tops and the bottoms, and then we go through our bottling process. Got it. And is there, what makes the fizziness of it, the sparkling side of it? So on the sparkling side, it's, it's, it's carbonation. So what we, we have, everything we start with is still apple juice. Got it, okay. For our sparkling products, we have a carbonation process where we introduce at very, very low temperatures uh, this, the CO2 that binds and creates the carbonated aspect. Much like you would carbonate any sort of juice product, you have to introduce that, that bubbliness to, to the product. One main type of variety of apple that you use, or is it multiple varieties? So the key to our process is a, a multiple varieties, but anchored by a, a handful of really high quality flavorful apples. So you guys have, I think of sparkling cider, but you have so many different types of not only sparkling ciders, but just a lot of different other products. Abs absolutely, we have a variety of sparkling and still products. On the cider side, we have sparkling grape, cranberry, sparkling pomegranate, mango, sparkling peach, sparkling pear, a variety of different blends where we have our core 100% apple cider and then a variety of blends and flavored uh, sparkling ciders. On the still side, we stick predominantly to our apple juice and apple ciders in a variety of different sizes, gallon, half gallon, liter and a half, 750 milliliter and 10 ounce. But we want to serve a variety of different customers in a variety of different channels. So we have multifamily packs, single serve packs, all in. We have about 100 different products that we sell. That's incredible. And we talk about over 100 different products. Where do these products end up? 
So right now, Martinelli is, is sold across the country and across the world. We have about 40 different countries that we sell our product wow. into, and, and that part of our business, that export part of our business, is, is growing faster even than our domestic part of our business. So we expect that number to continue to grow. And there's something I'm excited to share with our viewers is the fact that they can come now visit you and see all these amazing products. Talk about this new incredible display that we're actually standing in the midst of right here. Well, we built this, uh, this we call it a company store in our museum as a celebration of the Pajaro Valley and all that is the Pajaro Valley has to offer, of which we're a part. And we obviously have a lot of our history in this, in this store, but we also have a lot of history of the valley itself in terms of the different companies, the different products, the, the rich history of this region. And of course, we have all of those, those 100 different product, products that we mentioned. You can sample them all right here. Well, Gunn, thank you so much for sharing this information about this incredibly important company. It's a brand that's just so synonymous with celebrations. It's a brand that I grew up with that I love so much. My kids now love it. I, I just, I'm so excited to be able to share this with our viewers and to get to come see it firsthand has just been an awesome opportunity. Well, thank you very much for visiting. I hope all your viewers come and visit. We're excited for the next 150 years and, and celebrating this great region of California that we're in. Appreciate it. Thanks so much. All right. Thank you. Here on Valley's Gold, I love my food segments, and this one is no different. I've been joined by one of my favorite chefs, Rod Hansen of The Painted Table. Rod, thanks for joining me. Thank you, Ryan. Good to be back. I love everything you do for us here on Valley's Gold, and today is no exception. Well, today for apples, we are doing a brown butter apple cake. Brown butter apple, apple cake. cake. So yes. we're used to the all American pies, but you're going to yes. be using apples for a cake. Apples for a cake. <laughs> and it kind of takes all the good things from an apple pie into a cake. It's actually easier to make than a pie. That's Sounds amazing. An added bonus, right? Yeah, a very added bonus. <laughs> Let's begin with the apples, Let's I guess, right? Let's make a brown butter apple cake. Okay. And so, you always got to start with the main ingredient, you apples, You got to start <laughs> with the apples. So today we're going to be using Granny Smith apples and Braeburn apples. And I like to use two different kinds of apples because it kind of brings in different flavors. You got kind of the tart and sweet between those two flavors. Exactly. And, so. and the, the Granny Smith is very tart, whereas the Braeburn is a little more on the sweet side has kind of a spiciness to it, almost like a nutmeg and cinnamon flavor, which goes really nice with uh, the cake. And during the right seasons, you can find these California grown. You can, California grown right here. Fantastic, yes. well, let's begin. Okay, I'm gonna begin by peeling our apples. That's always the, uh, probably the most important part of any kind of apple recipe. Part, yes. Next, we're gonna slice the apples up. It's time to add the ingredients. So lemon juice is the first thing we're going to be adding. Lemon and juice. Lemon juice. And the lemon juice is going to help prevent the oxidization of the apples, which turns them brown. Got it. Okay. And to me, it adds a little bit of uh, tanginess, helps bring out the flavor, so it's not so sweet when you add in your sugars. Absolutely. Okay. okay. And next we have cinnamon sugar. We're which, dump that in. honestly, isn't too much. It's not a lot, no. This isn't an overly sweet dessert. It's that really the apples are the star of the dessert, whereas the Using brown the butter, flavors, yeah. Yeah, the natural flavors, and the brown butter just kind of helps accent everything. Got it, thing. okay. And now it's ready to go into So yeah, the we've already made dish. Dish. transformation to making it look like a cake now, so. Yes. The next step is the brown butter cake. Oh, well that's fantastic. Let's see what it takes to make this. And okay. again, simple. Very simple, so this is the brown butter, okay. and I've already browned this, but it, this is browned on a medium heat. And so this is just your standard butter cube? Standard, this is salted butter. Salted now, butter. Salted butter, and it's just on medium heat for about, oh, seven minutes or so of white sugar. Okay. Okay, and we're gonna mix that in, and actually, if you wanna mix that in for me, do just that. keep doing that, and I'll get the eggs going. And of course, you can't make a cake without eggs, it seems like, so. Yeah, you kind of need eggs. It binds <laughs> it together. It is know? a binding agent. It is a binding agent. So how am I doing here? Good you're enough doing to be, uh, great. chef quality? J uh, you're doing <laughs> very well there. And we're going to pour in a couple eggs there and just mix those in. There you go. And this, this was, is, and the total of five eggs for this recipe, it looked like? This is five eggs, and we're going to put the rest in there and just keep mixing that until it all comes together. The uh, change of the texture of this taking place in front of my eyes is amazing. Isn't it? Yeah. It turns from kind of lumpy yeah. into, it's a smooth, silky, beautiful. Okay. So you just want to keep mixing until you've incorporated your eggs and you can't see the, the egg any longer. 
We're getting close to there. Yeah, and that's looking pretty good. Look at that beautiful. There, that's perfect. Perfect. Well, fantastic. So now it's ready for the flour. So we're gonna put our salt in first down okay. there, add it in. And then this is 12 ounces of all-purpose flour. Got it. Okay. I got this down. And you just wanna try to keep it on the bowl there and just kinda go right around. There we go. There you go. And of course I made a mess, but you that's can't be okay. in the kitchen without making a mess, right? Got to make it look like we've been really busy, <laughs> exactly. right? Exactly. <laughs> After you sift it in, it's very important to sift your flour in because you can end up with lumps if, if you don't. Ready and look to how easy that was. Top. Yeah, We're ready to go. So I'm just going to take this easy. and I'm going to spoon it over the top. And then you just want to spread it a little bit here. Doesn't have to be perfect at all. This one is now ready to go to the oven? We're going to put a little bit of cinnamon sugar on the top and it's of ready course. to go in the oven and that's it. <laughs> you so, always got to have that cinnamon sugar on top, you know, right? It just it's brings just not it all together. It's not an American cake or pie without it. It so. is not. It needs that. Really, you can put as much as you want or as little as you like. So. And because of the magic of TV, we're going to throw it in there and automatically have it done. But for how long do we really have to cook this <laughs> and at what temperature? Really, this takes at 275, about 45 minutes. Fantastic. Wow. What a difference. That's <laughs> incredible. So obviously, does that smell amazing? It smells absolutely amazing. <laughs> smells like cinnamon and that brown butter, and, the apple. And you know this rod, we're on Valley's Gold. We're not just going to sit here and look at this pretty thing. No, we're going to eat it. We have to try. It. <laughs> absolutely. So I mean, I always come prepared. I mean. We actually have some very fancy digs here now, so I'll let you do the honors okay. of uh, breaking this thing up. And you said you were really hungry earlier, so I'll give you a <laughs> very much so nice large piece there. And you know me well; I love I love the corner pieces. There you go. I'm with you on that. You get a nice crispy piece with it. <laughs> As you can see, the apples are all at the bottom there. Absolutely, the cake is... and you can just tell by the time that you were scooping it out, it had so they have softened up a lot. They so. have softened up a lot, but they're still nice and cube looking. Yep. <laughs> this can compete with your all-American apple pie, can it? Yes, it can. Wow. And a lot easier, right? Yeah, absolutely <laughs> a lot easier. Well, again, Rod, this is absolutely incredible. So simplistic. I absolutely love it. Thank you for sharing it with us. Well, thank you very much. And it was our pleasure to be here today. And at the Painted Table, we're just so happy to bring Valley's Gold, all these little things that we like to do and all the flavors from the Valley. Well, you guys do an amazing job and I just can't wait to see what you have for me next time. Thank you. <laughs> and I hope all of you will join me next time for more Valley's Gold. Valley's Gold is produced through a partnership between the Fresno County Farm Bureau and Valley PBS. Production funding for Valley's Gold is provided by the Myers Water Bank and Wildlife Project, an educational outreach program working to teach students about water and wildlife issues in California. Field trips are free for all schools and each trip's curriculum is based on learning about California water resources Valley Agriculture, and Native Wildlife. Everyone enjoys getting together to laugh, to talk, and mostly to eat. It sounds so simple, but the reality is that it takes a lot of hard work to feed us. The next time you sit down to eat, remember to thank our farmers, Gar Tutelian Incorporated since 1949 at 800-696-6108. Heroes come in all shapes and sizes. At Brandt, our heroes are the men and women in the field, the folks who work hard to put food on our tables. Join us in celebrating the Valley's real heroes. Brandt, professional agriculture.